G'day Legends, welcome to another installment of Friday Q&A. I hope you've all been fantastic, as always, to everybody who submitted a question for this week's Q&A. Thank you so much. If you have a question you would like to submit for next week's Q&A, simply put it in the comments section below. And if you want to support what I do here on the channel, you can check the video description and follow a bunch of links to do that. Let's dive straight in. How much time and how much effort goes into maintaining all the gear that I have here? And is there a particular piece of gear which I have ever sold that I kind of regret? This one comes from friend of the channel, GT Singh. Go and subscribe to GT's channel if you haven't already. Fantastic player and educator and just an all-round lovely human being as well. I love you, man. Great question. I would say that there's probably a split between the stuff that I gig with, which is heavily maintained. I restring it regularly. You know, I kind of like polish it up and I oil the fretboards and I make sure everything's in working order and, you know, spray contact cleaner into the pots and the jacks every couple of months. Just kind of basic maintenance stuff that I need to do to make sure the things that I gig with are going to work. And then there's probably the more like yearly stuff that I do on the instruments that maybe I don't play as often as others, but I do try to kind of keep strings. If I can't keep them new, I will keep them clean. And, you know, I use stuff like Dux Deluxe Axe Wax on my strings to make sure there's no grime and things like that. Uh, Perth is mostly close to the ocean, wherever you are. So the air is a little bit saltier and things tend to degrade a little bit quicker. So I kind of have to be on top of stuff. And then, you know, in terms of the rack stuff and my pedals and things like that, I do try to like dust them down. I have a little uh, kind of air blower for that. And, you know, just generally try to treat my gear with some kind of respect that it deserves because I've got some really, really lovely pieces in here that aren't being manufactured anymore and they're hard to service and, you know, stuff like the old Eventides and the 2290 and some old Gibsons and Fenders and things like that. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things, right, where you think of an instrument as something you own, but I guess in a sense, you're really just the steward of that particular instrument for a little while because most of these things will outlive me and the idea of kind of keeping it in some kind of decent condition for whoever is going to get to use it for another lifetime, I think is a good thing to pay forward. I mean, in terms of things that I have regretted selling, well, if you saw my video with the Crowther Audio Hotcake, you know that I regretted selling that. I actually ended up buying back another one. So that's a very good example of the cycle of gear acquisition syndrome. Uh, outside of that, not really anything I can think of, but when I was a kid, I did have a shiny foil Charizard Pokemon card that in my teens I traded for, I can't even remember what I traded it for, it was something stupid. And you know, those things are worth quite a bit now. Have I ever played one of the Red Beach Ibanez Voyages? No, but I would love to. I know a few people who have them and you know, they generally seem to get pretty good reviews. You know, they're not necessarily considered kind of as fancy as the Red Beach Sir Koa guitars, but you know, the Voyage is cool in the Ibanez line. There's sort of that, the RG550, the Petrucci with the sort of like Picasso paint job style thing on it. And of course, the Paul Gilbert Iceman Destroyer Hybrid, the Ice Destroyer that I think really appealed to me from that particular era of like late 80s, early 90s Ibanez stuff. My favorite rock biography or book, I read quite a few of those in my teens. And you know, I have gone back and reread a few sections of some of them and with the benefit of hindsight, you know, you can kind of see through the murky mystique of some of these things. David Lee Roth's biography, Crazy from the Heat, is one that definitely stuck with me and was very influential on me and just Dave kind of, you know, writing about all the interesting things that they did in their life. I was expecting to read this kind of sex, drugs and rock and roll bio, but, you know, you get stories about Dave being a paramedic or about, you know, sort of the special fans that he would run into and try to catch up with on every single tour. And he kind of left all the debauched stuff maybe off the pages, which is kind of the opposite of like the Gene Simmons biography, which is basically just all about that stuff. Like, you know, here's how much stuff I did and how much money I made. But Gene's biography was pretty cool as well. Hammer of the Gods, of course, is essential reading if you only come out of it just kind of going, wow, Led Zeppelin's management were a bunch of thugs. And I did read Richard Cole, who I believe was their 
tour manager. His biography was really, really interesting, actually, sort of, uh, you know, lifting the lid again on some of that mystique. So, yeah, those ones are really good. Obviously, there's stuff like Pete Townsend's biography, which is very, very heavy in parts and pretty interesting that I still haven't read all of. And I feel like I said this the last time I answered a question like this. So, but by all means, let me know your recommendations for great rock and roll biographies in the comment section below. Did I go and see Kiss in Perth last week? Sadly, I did not. I was gigging and I've seen Kiss live before. They are a band that I definitely appreciate. I like their stage show. There's a bunch of Kiss songs that I really, really like, but I am by no means a super fan. But uh, Cam went and loved it. Cam is a massive, massive Kiss fan. And Brian took his kids who are massive Kiss fans. So it's amazing to see their kind of impact getting paid on generation to generation. And I guess we'll see if this really is the last time they do a tour or if it will be one of those kind of Motley Crue style things where it's like, hey, this is the last one, except for the next one and except for the next one. If I showed up to a gig and all my gear broke, but somebody had an interface and a laptop and some plugins, what plugins would I use to get through a gig? Well, I'm pretty comfortable with stuff like the Mercurial audio plugins. I really like Spark for a Marshall style thing. So if it was going for like a rock and roll thing, I would use Spark, but I would probably say Reaxis because it's got some great Triaxis and Mark style tones in there. And that would probably do everything that I need for a particular gig. The neural DSP stuff, of course, sounds fantastic. And even things like Guitar Rig these days are pretty amazing. And the new Amplitude capture stuff is something that I definitely want to check out as well. Quad tracking, should you use the same amp and change up your cabs or should you use the same cab and change up your amps? My experience with quad tracking has mostly been using the same cab, whether it's the same cabinet impulse response or whether it is the same physical cab and then you know doing a set of doubles with one head and a set of doubles with another head. If you've listened to Ragdoll's Back to Zero album, every track on there is a set of doubles with the Boogie Jewel Rectifier and some other amp like a Marshall DSL or a Soldano or a Splorn Nitro or an ADA MP1, those kind of things. So that's kind of how I have done it in the past. I think what's nice about that is the cab provides this kind of final sheen on everything. It kind of determines the overall character, but then the amps will give you a different texture to the sound. So you can go for something like a super smooth sounding amp, then with something that sounds really crispy and like blend those through the same kind of end chain. But by all means, if you've tried it with different cabs, I'm sure that would work pretty well too. I've got a few, have I checked them out yet? So I'm gonna run through these. Raging Slab, in particular, their live album. I had not checked that one out, so that was one that I really enjoyed listening to. The new King's X, I have not listened to anything except the single. I'm gonna try and sit down and listen to it over the weekend. If anybody has heard that, feel free to share your thoughts and opinions in the comment section below. And the other one was the Funky Junction LP. I haven't checked that one out. In fact, I had never heard about that one. So thank you for the suggestion. That one is gonna go in there with the new King's X in terms of new things to listen to. What's everybody listening to this weekend? Again, I know I've said a lot. There's like a lot of questions I have asked all of you. So if there's some new music that you would recommend me checking out, I am always all ears. And one last one for this week. I know it has been a slightly shorter Q and A, my favorite blues albums and blues players. I really, really got deep into some blues stuff when I first started playing guitar. I would say the bands that first got me into playing guitar were blues based bands like Thin Lizzy and Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin. And then, you know, I heard Gary Moore in particular, Still Got the Blues and After Hours. So they go straight into the collection and Stevie Ray Vaughan, of course, like everything Stevie Ray Vaughan I love. Who doesn't? I mean, if you're gonna put Hendrix in the blues category, definitely a bunch of Hendrix stuff. Robin Trower, I would consider blues as well. And Bridge of Size, if we're talking about blues, that is probably my favorite blues-based album, even though it's more like psychedelic rock ambient thing. But yeah, Trower really, really does it for me. Uh, James Dewar, their voice is just stunning. And Bridge of Size is an absolute masterpiece. But then going back to you know some electric blues, Freddie King, I remember learning Hideaway like a lot of younger players would have over the years. And then getting into Albert King, you know, the Albert King and Stevie Ray Vaughan album that they did together is amazing. And you really hear the influence of Albert King down through 
the ages. And of course, BB King, you know, you can listen to BB King just sit there and absolutely just lays in the pocket and have that unique vibrato. I could listen to BB King play all day. I feel like I'm kind of ranting at the moment, but there's surely a bunch of other stuff. I will admit that one thing I haven't done is gone back and listened to a lot of pre-electric blues guitar stuff. And that's probably something I should do, you know, listen to the stuff that is foundational to all the modern music that we love, especially metal, especially rock, especially basically everything that uses stuff that, you know, has a little bit of vibrato in it or a little bit of an inflection that moves outside of the keys that you get on a piano. So yeah, maybe they're kind of stock boring choices. I would probably put like Danny Gatton in there as well, even though Danny did like the country jazz blues hybrid stuff. And of course, the mighty Roy Buchanan, the Messiah will come again is one of the most stunning evocative guitar things that I think I've ever heard in my life. Definitely go and check out some Roy Buchanan. Go and check out one of the Three Kings this weekend and check out Robin Trower, Bridge of Size, and you know, some Stevie Ray and a bunch of other stuff and go and have some fun. And that is it for this week's Q&A. I actually have to cut this up and then run off to not one, but two gigs. I was away last night up in the Pilbara doing a show and I got a show tomorrow. So four gigs in three days is a lot of work, but it's kind of nice to be out there and playing music. And I'm certainly fortunate to be doing that. So I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below, and I will see you all next week. Take it easy. Oh,